it's all co- it's coming together. And that's the thing. Um, what what I'll probably be um, discussing, and you know, as we get into the cosmology, is when you understand this type of cosmology as preposterous as it seems, given what we're told about the solar system. What it does is it actually frees you from uh, the sense of doomsday um, that uh, you know um, uh, that is propagated so much. You know, comets slamming into the planet, uh, pole shifts, all this kind of stuff. Um, the cosmology represented by plasma physics and so on like that gives a very different and actually a much safer uh, situation for us. And ultimately, you know, I'll, I'll get to the point where it's actually our own actions, the actions of ourselves as a, as, as a species that are the biggest threat to us in bringing about a new doomsday. I was very much relieved of a, of a burden in understanding that asteroids and comets just simply don't behave the way that they are uh, portrayed in films. Actually, the, the way what we just talked about, I'd like to, if it's okay with you, keep that right into the dialogue and just keep rolling from here, because I think that is a framework that I'd like to go into a little bit, Troy, is sure. as we continue to say, at this point, I want to say to people, keep your minds open on this, because it's not something that you you hear every day, and it's not something you're going to experience, and I promise you a big reward at the end. So go with us, enter a world as if you were watching a movie, as if you were listening to a story, and just imagine that it's true, whether you know it is or you don't know, you think it's false, whatever, wherever you are on your belief systems, stay open with us for a little bit is, is where we're about to go, and uh, you will have, in my opinion, a really nice reward for doing it and if you want to add something to the framework of what what we're getting ready to talk about i'd appreciate that too okay well the the way the way i see it is that up to this point we've discussed mechanisms of control by groups of um, people over our financial system that are deeply rooted in the archetypes that come out of what is called a uh, golden age and of course for many people the golden age is purely a fiction or a myth it's just something that was created to to have interesting stories and so on. But what uh, I'm proposing uh, in Saturn and Death Cult is that the Golden Age actually did exist, but it existed at a time when the, co- the cosmology or the, uh, the, the way in which the solar system was formed was very, very different to the one in which we uh, are told uh, today, the one in which we exist in today. And I think for many people, my experience has been that for many people this is actually the most radical part of the thesis the uh, a complete and utter change in the history of the solar system within historical times and basically to do that the reason for doing that is it's incumbent on people who who claim the influence of saturn on uh, these occult traditions the the mythologies it's incumbent for them to come up with a working physics model, a working cosmological model, to explain how Saturn developed such a uh, a, a deep-seated position in the human psyche uh, and and within our our cosmology. So at that point, I think, uh, shall we launch into this, uh, Mark? Yeah, let's let's launch into this, and it brings up some things about which I hope you get into. And if not, by the end of this, if you can remind me, I'd like to get into the idea of the lining up and the changing of history and why they do that compared to where you're going with it. Right. So if we don't touch on it where you're going, that that was a really big spike for me in understanding. Mm-hmm. And uh, mm-hmm. so, anyways, yeah, let's let's launch right into this. So you're saying basically somewhere in our history, in recent recordable history, not thou- tens of thousands, hundred thousand, millions of years ago, mm-hmm. that fairly recently there was something different in the skies that when we look up, the stars weren't the same. There was something different. The ancients had a completely different heavens, a set of heavens to the ones that we see today. And I think what I'll do is I'll quote one of the leading investigators in this uh, this cosmology, which has been dubbed Saturn theory. It's a cosmology that stems out of the work being done in a, a science called the electric universe and plasma physics, which denotes electricity as the main force for change in the universe, in the uh, solar system and all related celestial bodies. And basically what Duardo Cardona says is that the evidence of myth which points to Saturn having once occupied a position above Earth's north polar regions is voluminous. There is not a race on Earth that has not preserved at least one account which 
expects as much. According to this evidence, Saturn occupied a central position in the North Celestial regions. It rotated and rotated widely, but other than that, it was immovable. And that's the end of the quote. Now, what we're being told here from mythology is so radically different to the Newtonian view of uh, our solar system, a system that's been around for a system of understanding that has been around for nearly 400 years that says that mass is the only source of gravity and that gravity is the only force which um, determines movements and uh, paths of uh, celestial bodies through the, uh, the solar system and the universe in general. And of course, what we have heard from scientists taking that as their basic understanding is that they've developed concepts like dark matter, black holes, to create a gravity-driven only universe. There is a competing, very young scientific line of investigation that says that gravity is not the the only force in the uh, uh, governing the movements of uh, celestial bodies, but that electricity plays by far the dominant role, and that the means by which electricity is um, transmitted between celestial bodies is through the uh, substance called plasma, and plasma being a substance that is often referred to as the fourth state of matter in the universe and is now generally recognized to constitute well over 95, if not up to 99% of all matter in the universe. Electricity flows through plasma better than any other form of matter there is. It's a, it's a virtual perfect conductor of electricity. And the electric... You okay, can I, say, can right? I stop mm-hmm. you? Two, two things. It's, it seems like what you're saying is on the level of... Uh, the sun does not revolve around the earth. We revolve around the sun. This is of, of that kind of enormity of what yeah, you're saying. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a complete paradigm shift. People who work in electric universe circles, and there are some very, very serious uh, physicists out there. These are not uh, fringe people who are doing this kind of research, whether it's Walter Thornhill or um, Anthony Perrette, who actually runs a lab out at Los Alamos in America for... Um, plasma physics and so on. These people, Walter Thornhill, uh, Walt Thornhill actually said he now knows what it must have felt like knowing that the Earth was round back in the early 1400s when everybody <laughs> believed that uh, they would fall off the edge of, of the Earth at that time if they sailed far, far enough. It's quite literally that much of a change. Science today has created an incredible idea um, and that is that if it cannot be calculated mathematically it therefore cannot exist and one of the problems with that idea is that they now rely on mathematical models to explain our uh, our our solar system our um, our cosmos one of the things that is they found with the mathematical models is that with everything we can see with the naked eye and even with radio telescopes and so on like that It simply does not explain how a gravity-only driven system can can keep the universe in its uh, current state. And so what they have assumed as a result of that is the existence of dark matter and black holes to compensate for the lack of large masses that would be needed to govern the current movements of planets that we see today. The electric universe says you don't need black holes You don't need dark matter. Everything can be explained by the addition of electricity as the the means by which uh, celestial bodies uh, interact with each other. In other words, gravity is... Sure? Remember, in other words, gravity. Uh, One of the other places that I got a little confused was you said electricity and then plasma, Mm -hmm. but electricity goes through plasma. So electricity and plasma are not the same thing? Definitely not. Or are they the same thing or different... Electricity is the force, all right, that travels, and plasma is the means by which it is it, it is uh, transmitted, conducted. Plasma, think of plasma um, throughout the universe as the uh, telephone lines and power lines that string cities together and, and so on like that on Earth. Electricity travels through these vast cosmic power lines that we, uh, that we see in space, and this is the basic premise of the electric universe. It's... Uh, this idea that uh, this is actually the dominant force, not not gravity, not unseen 
unprovable dark matter and uh, and black holes, but but actually uh, electricity. And what is in, implicit in that that gravity is in fact an electrostatic phenomena. It totally new take. Uh, yes, the 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 Earth's mass does play a part in it, but it is more likely that the Earth's magnetic field and its relation to other celestial objects play an even greater role in determining what gravity actually is. Now, this is heresy in, in modern science. This, you can't take this to uh, even your, um, I don't know what you call them in America, we call them primary schools and uh, high schools here in New Zealand. Elementary or grade schools and then high schools. Well, you can't take it to your high school physics uh, teacher, science teacher, and get a serious conversation on this. It's still at a very, very young age in, you know, in terms of um, its, its development and also its acceptance. But it is, it, it's phenomenal how many scientists who have retired are now converting over to the electric universe model for the simple reason that having retired, they no longer face prohibitions and consequences of you know adhering to such what seems like such a a heretical model of science, something that uh, rejects Newtonian mechanics as the only force uh, in our solar system. So really, it's like the it's like the Catholic Church, but now it's the scientific church. Oh, you couldn't put couldn't put it better. Yeah, that's um, yeah. Modern <laughs> the, modern science is a priesthood, and the high priests are the astrophysicists. The astrophysicists in the world today refuse to accept that electricity can be transmitted through space. They simply do not believe that el electrical charges can exist in space. Unfortunately for them, the evidence is now overwhelming. But in terms of paradigm shifts, what we're seeing in the world, of course, is that they take this knowledge that goes against the, um, the mainstream thought. They say, what a surprise, and then they start to try and knead it into a shape that fits the existing model. And uh, we start seeing all kinds of descriptions for electrical phenomena in space being, you know, we, we, they talk about solar winds. They talk about, um, you know, fluid dynamics as a, as, you know, as a way of describing the particles in space. When electricity is the perfect solution for explaining how, how these particles work and so on. This is, the, this is the basis for a different view of the solar system. And what the electric universe does is it provides a platform to understand how it could be that uh, this large body, this, uh, this planet, the sun in its own right, could have once existed in the celestial north um, above the Earth. When modern day science tells us, oh no, the planets formed four billion years ago, and they did so according to an accretion disk. And uh, that's why we're all on this sort of uh, giant spinning, like a, like a vinyl record, uh, with all the planets in their particular place. But there are vast problems with, with the modern concept of, of planet formation and the solar system as it is. The biggest problems facing them, of course, is um, the planet Saturn itself and the planet uh, Venus. They do not fit into the accretion model. To kick this off where we're going with this cosmology that is called Saturn theory, it's important to understand that the current planet Saturn now is, is known to exhibit more characteristics that are consistent with a star than they are with a planet. It glows under its own uh, power. The very strange uh, existence of poles that are warmer than the equatorial regions of the planet, this is completely at odds with mainstream scientific uh, thought and such. And what that actually leads us to deduce is that it's perfectly within the realms of plausibility to say that Saturn was a star once in its own right. And then we, that's where we turn to mythology and say, well, cracky, once upon a time there was a star, a big planetary body that shone as a sun in its own right up in the northern celestial realms. And in mythology, that's identified as Saturn. So Saturn theory takes the uh, electric universe concepts of, of cosmology applies it to the planet Saturn, and provides what we'll discuss now, a, a very plausible cosmology for how Saturn could have actually existed in that position that we've discussed. Before we go into that, you said two things that I'm still spinning mm -hmm. on. One of them, that Saturn glows of its own accord, mm -hmm. and t the second one is that the, 
the poles are as warm as the equator on Earth? Absolutely. Uh, the uh, not 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 uh, the, as the equatorial regions of the Earth. The poles are warmer than Saturn's equatorial regions, which makes no sense. Oh. All right, because particularly what's what's bizarre is that with Saturn's orbit around the sun as we know it today, it, it takes 29 years, which means that 14 and a half years one of the poles will spend 14 and a half years in total darkness receiving no light from the sun yet that pole is as warm mm. it is warmer than the equatorial regions exposed to the sun and war as warm uh -huh. as the uh, as as the other pole which is exposed to the sun for 14 and a half years it makes no sense in in uh, mainstream scientific thought how interesting of course the other thing is that um When you go back to the writing to Velikovsky, the pioneer in this, a guy who really broke the ice, uh, got a lot wrong, uh, but only in the sense that uh, he provided us all with uh, stepping stones towards other investigations and so on. But he was the guy who predicted that Saturn would emit uh, X-rays uh, and Jupiter would emit X-rays, something which in the gravity-driven, electrically neutral world of uh, Newtonian mechanics was just ridiculous uh, it, 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 it couldn't be yet we know that saturn emits massive x-rays uh, radio waves gamma rays and so on again everything that is consistent with a certain type of star now that certain type of star uh, that we're talking about is a uh, sub brown dwarf star and we in science know or those in science know that sub-brown dwarf stars are almost indistinguishable from you know, gas giant planets in terms of their behavior as we see it. And that these sub-brown dwarf stars are very difficult to, de to detect through optical means and so on. They usually have to be found through radio telescopes that can pick up the X-ray and gamma ray uh, emissions and so on uh, that these things have because they are very dark They don't glow like a red giant. Yet, in the space between us and the nearest red giant after the sun, there are probably billions of these things floating around out there in space that can't be seen, but we know are actually there. It, it's postulated in the Saturn theory that Saturn itself was in fact a sub-brown dwarf star in a previous epoch. And in Saturn theory the general premise is that the Earth uh, as a planet was in a relationship with that sub-brown dwarf star that became Saturn long before it came into um, uh, under the influence of the sun, the sun that we know today. Now, this is so incredibly at odds with what every school child is taught and what every mainstream scientist uh, believes. But what we're basically saying is that at least three planets in the system are interpol interpolators into this current solar system that they were captured at a time in history that is quite recent and and, and that this lineup of planets uh, that is basically saturn a sub brown dwarf star mars is involved and the earth is involved at least drifted into the influence of the sun that we see today and a series of cataclysmic reactions took place on, a, on a, an electrical level, which, number one, heralded the beginning of the uh, Golden Age, and then ultimately, I believe, around about uh, 4,000 years later, saw the separation of Earth from its parent star, uh, original star, Saturn, which be, became what we know as the doomsday event in human history, which led to the current skies that we now see today. Okay. So the, there, there's a lot oh, there. Yeah. And let me, let me just re, restate it to see if I've, I've got it fairly correctly. It, at one time in history, our current sun was not associated with Earth and a, a direct alignment of other planets, including Saturn as the main one, Venus, Mars, uh, in some kind of an alignment. Mm -hmm. And that throughout tr moving through space, somehow we came connected with the draw of our sun, which was a bigger force than Saturn was on our planet. And that through that, Saturn 
somehow disconnected, and that was the Doomsday event, our original star, our original sub brown, uh, brown dwarf star that we were so used to now was separated kind of went off farther into space where we could barely see it as compared to where it was the main event in the sky mm-hmm. now that the sun becomes the main event in the sky and takes over and through that it created a catastrophe but it also brought in the golden age and then the the, the golden age lasted for four thousand years and that was the time when saturn kind of went off of or went out of the the main pull or the connection that it that it had before so there at one point there was two suns actually saturn and the sun but then at the doomsday event saturn kind of left the the orbit so to speak it, it left its position at the north north celestial uh, regions of earth from earth's perspective it, it dropped out of existing in the north the celestial north and basically this is is the death of saturn in mythology and the, through through this process, there was actually more cataclysmic events with Saturn leaving than there was when the sun came in? Yes, absolutely. Um, the Golden Age is often, again, as I say, misconstrued as a time of total security. People, people often make this mistake between um, great times and security. America and the West at the moment is going through that. They believe freedom is synonymous with security. What was happening in the Golden Age was not free of cataclysmic events, but the changes wrought in the psychology and actually the uh, knowledge of mankind as a result of this proposed contact between a sub brown dwarf star called Saturn and the uh, red giant star that we know as the Sun changed forever the way the environment that mankind existed on this planet here on Earth. On, on Earth, that cataclysmic change starts with a major cataclysm that heralds this uh, golden age uh, period. Now, I'll, I'll get into a timeline for your listeners uh, to get a better idea of this or, and, and, and what exactly was happening. But, yeah, Please, but it, yes. it, it basically heralds the beginning of that, that event called the golden age. But because of the influence of the sun, the encroaching sun, as this uh, system was captured, as the Saturn system was captured by the sun, as a result of the influence of that, Saturn ultimately wilted and its position was lost and it migrated during that time out to the position where it is and Earth assumed the position that we are in now. Basically, the planet scattered at that particular time. Now, I think, Mark, what I, what I have to let your listeners know is, of course, this is the most preposterous um, idea for mainstream science, this idea of colliding planet systems where you get a complete rearrangement of how these planets are aligned with each other and you get the scattering and subsequent settling into this new system but that's exactly what we are proposing here and and saying uh, mythology records well wait a minute now this this is where this is where it's like there it is before their eyes but they won't see it the hubble telescope is showing us that all over the universe what's that the the the, the collision Oh, and, yeah. and the interacting of these different systems together, but yet here we are talking about it and, and, and actually have gone through it, and their data says that we've experienced yeah. it, and they're watching it happen now with the Hubble, but yet they can't reconcile the two things. They can't, because the, the paradigm that is dominant now in science, and uh, most people's PhDs and so on is dependent on perpetrating that paradigm, says it's a gravity-driven world, a uh, universe. They can't see the wood for the trees, so to speak. Uh, as a result, but yes, there's another part that goes into that too. Is that what you said? Is their PhDs and what and, and what does their PhD matter if they're not getting paid? Precisely, there's the financial control over keeping that paradigm, <laughs> you know, <They're>, existent. <laughs> so much amazing stuff here that is a paradigm shift uh, and on so many levels. And the idea of what you said about freedom and and, and security. That one went, that seemed really deep. That right. one, when you said that, there was somewhere along the lines, as you keep going with the cosmology of this, I'd, I'd like to enter into the difference between those, freedom and, and what we think of security, sure. and how that, that is an archetype that affects us too. Yeah. So please please proceed. Excuse well, me. Well, okay. Under the scenario, what I'm proposing is that the beginning of the, the Golden Age is not some kind of uh, flowering blossoming where it all starts with you know loveliness and security i'm saying that the golden age was actually it, it was created it came into being 
as a result of a major, major cataclysm that was experienced by the Saturn system of planets as it came into electrical contact with the sun. Now, I have to explain for your listeners, I have to explain how this works in an electric universe model. And what it actually is reliant upon is this. The various stars that we see throughout the universe, and even the ones we can't see, such as sub-brown dwarf stars, have what is called a plasma sheath. Science knows this. They accept that it's there. The sun's own plasma sheath, as we know it today, is called the heliosphere. It's a giant bubble that stretches way past Pluto. It's a, you know, and, and encapsulates the entire solar system as it is. And this particular sheath protects the solar system from what modern science calls the particle, you know, the dangerous particles uh, that exist out in interstellar space and so on like that. But essentially what electric universe concepts uh, claim is that the heliosphere is a protective Langmuir sheath or plasma sheath that creates a, an electrical environment within the solar system where everything at the stage in, the, in our history is balanced. Now, if another star with its own heliosphere were to approach the sun as we have it today, you would start to see electrical interactions fly through our solar system. The sun would do all kinds of crazy things. You would see effects on planets. And all that is happening is that as another star comes, its heliosphere or plasma sheath bumps into our heliosphere and plasma sheath and a discharge starts to take place, an electrical discharge. Exactly mm. the same thing that happens when you shuffle over to a radiator on a cold day and you touch that metal and you get a little electric shock from it. This is happening on a massive cosmological scale, but that's basically it. It's the same science uh, that is involved in that. Now, when that happens, what these two sheaths are doing is they are competing for equalization. Of course, the dominant charged object, because essentially it's two differently electrically charged objects, the dominant charged object will seek balance with the incoming lesser ch charged object. And, you know, it's just that's just basic uh, understanding of how, you know, uh, electrostatic you know, properties work. Now, what we're proposing is that in its deep, deep past, well before the beginning of the uh, Golden Age, the Earth existed within the plasma sphere of a sub-brown dwarf star called Saturn. And it did so in what's called a polar configuration. In other words, if you can imagine you've got a ball that you hold up in the air and you, you dangle a string down from the ball, and at the end of that string is another ball down below it. Yeah. So essentially, if you're standing on Earth's north pole, you're looking straight up at, at Saturn's uh, south pole. Now, that is what is called the uh, polar configuration. And before this body came into contact with the sun's heliosphere, this sub-brown dwarf star had its own plasma sheath that encapsulated this alignment of Earth with what would become Saturn. And in between Earth and Saturn was the planet Mars, another body, at least. All right, so... It's an unencumbered description with undue de detail. From Earth's perspective, and you're looking from the North Pole upwards, you would see a little dot against an even bigger dot or disk. The disk would, uh, the large disk would be glowing, that would be Saturn, and the little dot underneath it would be Mars. All right? And already I'm starting to describe what essentially looks like an eyeball from Earth's perspective. Yes. Okay? Now, what is happening is that this alignment of planets is taking place inside the plasma sphere of a sub-brown dwarf. And a sub-brown dwarf's plasma sphere is virtually opaque. That's why they're so difficult to detect for us today. And if you are inside that plasma sphere, you cannot see starlight from outside of the plasma sphere. It, it basically blocks all light coming in from outside. So you do not see stars. What you see is a chaotic ocean of reflected energy coming back from what from the energy that Saturn itself, as a sub-brown dwarf star, is emitting. And that energy being reflected back off this egg-shaped plasma sheath 
arrives on the on Earth in a uniform glow. That that basically means you're you're on a planet that has no seasonal changes, which is exactly the description we get from ancient mythology, alluding to what is called the uh, Purple Dawn uh, of time. Yes. And also, it, the uh, characteristic of this time is that rather than direct sunlight and bright sunlight, what the this planetary system experiences is a dull glow, a twilight, a perpetual twilight. And the energy that is given out by Saturn is of a frequency in the spectrum of light that uh, corresponds to red, to the red and the blue spectrums. Uh, sorry, yes, red and blue. And as a result of that, you get what's called a purple glow. All right, that's a natural thing. Hence the purple dawn that many indigenous cultures you know, refer to before the let there be light moment in human history. Now, so what I'm, des- what I'm describing here is primordial Earth in this dull twilight existence underneath a star where it spins on the same axis as the star and basically uh, experiences um, no seasons and such, cannot see starlight coming in from, out, from outside, has no idea about anything beyond the plasma sheath that is there. They just, to them, to somebody on the Earth, they're looking at a chaotic ocean. And for those living in the northern hemisphere who would inhabit Earth at that time, there's this dull radiating disk sitting up there in, in what we would call celestial north. Okay, does that make sense to you as a description uh, leading up to the Golden Age moment? Oh yeah, I'm mean, just maybe to add a, a couple things. I I know living up here in Mount Shasta, mm-hmm. it's a fourteen thousand one hundred and sixty-seven foot mountain, and a lot of times I'll go up on top and watch the sunsets. And there's a magical thing that happens right at the sunset or right past the sunset, is and, and it's actually in in some of our country songs, the Purple Mountains Majesty, right. and there's this purple hue glow that that just goes over the mountains. And, and I don't know if that's something that would be similar to it, but it's like a purple it light. It would be exactly like it. It would be exactly like it. It's gorgeous. And the other aspect of it, it seems like that it, if you would take that almost into when I was a kid, I used, we used to have these black lights or black mm-hmm. fluorescent lights that would create this kind of a, a purplish glow. But even fluorescent lights in themselves, in between, there's not a filament there's a gas that is, is filled up with with light. Mm-hmm. And so that, that's kind of where I'm thinking the combination of something like that. So it's a darker light. It's not a bright light like the sun we have today. It's more of it's a, an energy. A, a darker twilight. Yeah, it's an energy. It's a glowing okay. energy. Um, and it's completely conducive to life on Earth. But what it does is it, uh, plants start uh, uh, predominantly taking on a red hue uh, in their leaves. So you live in a basic purple, uh, you know, existence. It, when you say about what you described to me is in filmmaking, they call it magic hour. The magic light, yeah, Mag- magic time. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> in terms of the, the, you know, the sunset and so on. Another place to get an idea of what it would have been like in this environment is wherever you find the red seaweeds existent on, on Earth. If you were to dive in amongst those uh, and so on and look at the environment you're in, that kind of density of light in amongst that uh, would give you a very good idea of the kind of light because that seaweed uh, is having all of the green uh, harsh light of the current sun that we have filtered out by the the water so you're starting to get what w- what was what has happened what would have happened under a uh, sub brown dwarf star it makes perfect sense and what you're saying is basically the lineup so as we look to the north and we see mars with saturn behind it it's going to look like mm-hmm. an eye the all-seeing eye so yeah, to speak the all-seeing eye is starting to, it, mm-hmm. to to come into the the equation and that our earth is kind of uh cover it has this plasma shield of its own but yet it's incorporated with the sa- plasma shield saturn which then creates this glow but it creates an equal temperature throughout the earth where we're able to survive and and live from the from Saturn's influence as opposed to what we're so used to as the sun's influence. 
Absolutely. And you, you basically have an earth where there are no seasons, so there's no need for harvests. Basically, food grows around the clock, seven days a week, 365 days of the year, so to speak. Of course, there is no, at this particular time, crucial to this understanding, is there, there is no way to calculate time under that circumstance. You have no reference. The, uh, the, the sun doesn't move. Mars doesn't move under the sun. There are no stars sweeping oh. around the horizon. There's nothing on Earth to allow people any idea of how to calculate time, all right? And I have to also add to all this that guys like Walt Thornhill, some of the most interesting, interesting stuff I've heard is for those in the audience who favor, you know, searches for life on other planets, extraterrestrial life, there is certainly scope for this on the basis that instead of trying to look for a planet that mimics the same properties in its relationship to a star that we have with the sun, look to sub-brown dwarf stars and try to penetrate inside the plasma sheath. Look inside the plasma sheath because this plasma sheath, which is like a giant egg that is very dark when looking from outside of that plasma sheath and so on, inside it's probably the closest that you could get to what would be called the cosmic womb. It's a, a perfect place for the incubation of life in terms of, uh, you know, safety and so on, you know, for plants and so on to exist, for life to develop. That's huge. That's huge. It, it, and it reminds me of the, the, the old joke that goes around in therapy of uh, you see the drunk looking for his car keys underneath the street light, and you go over to him and say, what are you looking for? How can I help you? And he says, I'm looking for my car keys. And you look around and you don't see it. And you say, well, where do you last remember them? He goes, well, I was across the street over there. Well, why are you looking here? Well, because there's light here. <laughs> right. <laughs> and it actually, right. <laughs> there's light there, but it's not actually where the keys are. It, that, that, that's, that's, that's beautiful that, that there's, there's these possible wombs of, of planets just yeah, like eggs, Earth. And we're looking. You know, it's, wow. it's, it's, it's the egg of... Um, you know, even in even the mammals that give birth to their young in the womb, as we have it, it starts with an egg in the uh, female. So the egg shape is a natural constant in terms of the incubation of life throughout nature. So you're saying if we back up and we we get a dissociated position and look at the the, the configuration that we had with Saturn, Mars, and the Earth from a distance. Mm -hmm. of a fairly close distance to see it, you're saying that that actually is more of an egg shape than a round shape. Yes, yes. It, it definitely takes okay. an egg you know, sort of look to it. And particularly if you have, if you have the Earth stretched out down below, uh, you know, in this polar configuration, the plasma sheath will adapt to it to create that typical egg wow. shape as opposed to spherical shape. But, uh, yeah, essentially we're, we're describing a, uh, an incubation, you know, a system for incubation of life how many millions if not billions of years this existed for uh planet earth i wouldn't begin to tell because well i i, I do have certain theories about it based on the fossil record and things like that i'm i'm not somebody who believes in a in a young uh, earth and so on but what i do believe is in in an ancient earth in a completely different relationship with a completely different sun for the vast majority of its time before what is comparatively a very recent event of coming into contact with the sun, which is, I guess, you know, we're at that stage, what happens when this incubating plasma sheath uh, with Saturn in the middle and Earth and Mars in the middle of it comes into contact with the sun's heliosphere? This, of course, creates an electrical interaction. And what basically happens is that the plasma sheath that uh, surrounds Saturn would equalize with the Earth's heliosphere. It would yes. suddenly go from being opaque to being transparent. All right? And the other effect is that all of that electrical discharge taking place between these two plasma sheaths would be transferred into Saturn, and Saturn would go into a nova situation, a brown star nova. It would flare up. It would flare up to such a degree it would become a sun as we know it when we look up in the sky today and this is what Dwadu Cardona refers to as the let there be light moment 
in human history. That moment of contact between the plasma she uh, sheaths of the Sun and, and Saturn resulting in the transparency of, of the plasma sheath and, and Saturn going into Nova. The effect on Earth would have been startling. It would have been absolutely terrifying for uh, people existent at that time. And it would have had cataclysmic consequences as the Earth's own electrical charge would seek to equalize with Saturn that is seeking to equalize with the Sun. So you start to get this chain reaction, electrical chain, chain reaction. And of course, one of the huge consequences of that would actually be a changing in, the, uh, in gravity, the power of gravity on Earth itself. Increase or decrease? It would actually increase uh, depending on, uh, well, you know, it can decrease depending on the circumstances. But in this case, with the sun's added electrical input, I would say it increased. Now, the reason I'd say it increases, and I'm sure the guys in the electric universe, the, the hardcore scientists can give me a, a formula for how this happens. But what convinces me it increases is the this particular moment where this happens results in an extinction event for huge, gigantic animals, mammals such as the mammoth, the woolly rhinoceros, the giant sloth. It is about this time a, a massive die-off in these gigantic species that are no longer with us. I put that down in you know, my own theory that with the gravitational changes, there are certain animals that can't exist in the way that they did before. They can't adapt quick enough to deal with the extra heaviness that is affecting them. And so you get a die-off. We're back to that idea that gravity is really an electrostatic uh, phenomena, primarily, rather than purely a phenomena of mass. Wow. Yeah, I think of a balloon, you know, and then putting, you know, rubbing your hair on a balloon and then seeing the, the elect electrostatic, mm -hmm. it's it's all around the balloon. It just complete and wherever you bring it close to your hair, there's some kind of an interaction between the hair and the and the, and the balloon. I don't know if that's a something similar. It's exactly similar. Okay, and mm -hmm. like little bits of paper will just be drawn and, and sucked towards it. And, I, and even as a child, I think, well, why isn't that what's happening to us? Well, maybe we're being you know sucked in like like the balloon i used to see as a, as a kid mm -hmm. and the idea of the the woolly mammoths and the bigger the, the dinosaurs and things like that that maybe you're saying is that their body and their bone structure uh were developed for the you know or evolved because of the 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 gravity that was present and then the heavier gravity immediately they're now weighing it would be like us you know weighing two three times what we weigh and having to try to walk and, and feed ourselves and everything else it just it's not going to happen it's almost like a quick die off it would totally disrupt your ability to do things particularly for a non-rational creature all right it would it would disrupt their ability to to go about how they had experienced life before this you know, so they go through the trauma of, a, of an electrical interaction, a, a flaring up of this disc that had been up in uh, the north and so on. But the consequences after that is they still have to feed themselves the next day, go looking for it. Things have changed literally overnight to this, you know, to this effect. Smaller mammals can deal with it. The larger ones can't. Uh, I think, Mark, this is where we have to back up to understand where dinosaurs uh, and ice ages you know, play such an important role in what is going on here because what we're what we're postulating here is that the earth during its time under saturn encased in this uh, plasma sheath it would have whenever that uh, the, the host star that was saturn whenever it came into contact with any other celestial body crack it could be something the size of a moon or anything anything that had an electrical charge it would create a reaction in Saturn that would be uh, transmitted to the Earth. And I believe that this particular flaring incident that I'm talking about and coming to contact with the Sun starts the Golden Age. But prior to that, there probably had been many, many times that fl Saturn had flared, and the consequences on Earth were the various extinction events that took place. Now, what we have to understand is that the Saturn theory says that the sub brown dwarf star that was Saturn began its origins in another part of the galaxy. All right. And I favor the idea that we were part of the sub the Sagittarius sub galaxy galaxy that we know today is colliding with this part of the Milky Way. 
and that the journey that this Saturnian um, system of planets, Earth and Saturn, was taking would have been a, a very wide-ranging northerly spiral through space. And in that okay. huge big spiral as it was going, it would come into contact with various celestial bodies or the plasma sheaths of various celestial bodies. And it would spin away and re-equalize and go back to the how it was. Now, every time this happens, you get an inter an electrical interaction on Earth. And one of the things that you could postulate that takes place is you get a sudden emergence of extremely thick auroral clouds. All right. Oh, you know, the uh, aurora borealis um, that you get up in the, the northern uh, lights, the northern lights and so on like that. Now, under a sub brown dwarf star, that same result would take place whenever you get this re-equalizing of the electrical relationship between Earth and Saturn. And these lights would actually take on the, the look of a dense cloud, not the pretty things that we see today as a result of the sun we have now. But under a sub brown dwarf star, it's a very thick brown type uh, existence. And they would ring the Earth at what would be called the uh, uh, Arctic Circle and Antarctic Circle areas. And it just so happens that the Pleistocene, the last great ice age that took place, corresponds perfectly with where you would get an auroral, these auroral rings circling the Earth if Saturn and Earth had come into electrical imbalance. And under this particular uh, cloud, you would get a phenomena where the radiating energy of Saturn itself would not reach the Earth. And so, in perfect concordance with what we know about the Ice Ages, you would get bands, a ribbon of ice around what is basically the Arctic Circle, but not the polar cap uh, in both hemispheres of the Earth. And it's one of the great anomalies in, uh, for people studying the Ice Ages that it, the evidence that the polar regions remain ice-free until relatively recent has always been so at odds with the uh, mainstream idea of uh, the Earth's history. They can't understand it. But under, the, under this model of physics, it makes perfect sense that you get these occasional flare-ups. They produce these auroral clouds. These auroral clouds uh, intercept and interfere with the radiation onto the planet. It creates a shadow land in the areas that we know are glaciated at this time. So what I'm proposing is that on Earth's initial journey from the Sagittarian subgalaxy as it spiraled north, as it came into contact with the sun's heliosphere and so on, it was in a spinning pattern and that it would have brushed against that. Uh, the plasma sheaths would have brushed and literally bounced off each other. And the effect on Earth for the next 100,000 years was these dense auroral clouds that created the Ice Age. And as the Saturnian system then spiraled around and came into contact with the heliosphere, we had that let there be a light moment, which probably around between 10 and 15,000 years ago, okay. which resulted in Saturn's flaring up, all right, so that the Earth was now bathed in this light but lost this opaque sheath and could now see the universe in general in the way that we see it today. And that is the beginning of Saturn's capture by the sun. But previous to that, the Earth had enjoyed, not enjoyed, but uh, had suffered this ice age for well over 100,000 years. It was when Saturn finally gets captured by the Earth, you get that flaring moment. That's when you get the beginnings of the end of that particular ice age taking place. You get the die off of the big mammals because of the gravity change. You get massive tsunamis uh, that result because there is a bubble of water held in, in the north, where the North Pole is, that is suddenly released because Saturn and Earth's gravitational relationship has changed. And, and this leads to massive cataclysms on a planetary scale on the Earth as Saturn flares. You have now, at this point, entered into the beginnings of what is the Golden Age. Wow. What I was thinking towards the end of what you were just saying there is that this is... The concept and the idea is one thing, and now the foundation, building the idea of how our history coincides with that uh, more perfectly than what's been when been taught us. Sure. 
really then allows you to start going over to say, wait a minute, okay, there is something else that's happened in our history, which then begets to say that the Saturn death cult must have had, if they've kept records and they've been around for a long period, they must have some idea that this this happened. Why haven't they just taught that history? Well, again, this is the thing. They do. It's called mythology, and mythology makes uh-huh. up the, uh, the, the basis of their uh, ritual cults, but they have a warped understanding of, of mythology that is born of the amnesia of humanity in general, including them, where they only have to look up the skies and it, it doesn't match what mythology is telling them. All right. So wow. they enter into this process of turning mythology into spiritual metaphors and, and you know, the, the, the whole sort of gambit of, you know, stories that we have come down to us now. All the archetypes are still there from this time, but, you know, this, this distortion, which I firmly put down to amnesia through trauma on, uh, uh, on the corporate level of humanity has led people to go, well, I've, there's something truthful about this, but I just don't know what it is, and we end up going down the route of ritual and, and, and its various corruptions down through uh, that time. Now, the, the idea also that, that came to me was, you know, because of the idea of myth in these mythical mm-hmm. characters, and, and this is in my mind, and I'm just wondering if it's in other people's minds as well, that it seems like anything past the, the Romans and the Greeks, I have just assigned this idea of myth and not true. Cave drawings, old uh, ancient cultures, I... Indians, the, the people in Australia, the Aborigines, and everything that, that, that they say, and I start to go myth, 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 and it's like, it's that's not accurate that's not accurate just because we're at the perspective of seeing it as myth doesn't mean that the people back there weren't just drawing what they saw in the sky and we're trying to give some kind of memory exercise to remember by story of what happened mm-hmm. in the sky but they've got a way of of deciphering it so to speak am i making any yeah. sense with most definitely you're um what what sort of occurred to me i mean cracky the egyptian mythologies are a tangled web of seeming nonsense but the key the key to this is when we start to look at it not as in the skies were the same as we see it today but if we have this key cosmology that provides us with a plausible explanation for why there was a stationary sun um, that sat up in the north throughout mythology then all these sun worshipping cults that have these, you know, I mean, e- Egyptian sun worshiping cults that have that mainstream science says is all about the worship of the sun have got some serious problems in them. One of them is that Amun or Ra or uh, Cirrus, as, as he's called, is classed as a sun that shines at night. All right, so it makes no sense. It, it, it stays immovable in the sky. It doesn't move. This is echoed in mythologies all around the world. This other type of sun that is so different in characteristic to the sun we have today, it just stays there. It, it, it doesn't move, and it's inevitably linked to the north, uh, to this northern um, celestial realm. Now, you know, for us, for the, uh, living in this world today with, with the way science has described it, it's preposterous yes. to believe that they're actually describing, you know, the solar system as it was, and so on. So we, you know, we try to rationalize uh, their stories, we try to come up with ideas to explain what they saw, and, and, and I believe this process really did begin at a very early date, after what I would call the doomsday, when, when Saturn fell from uh, its position, that this process really began at an early date, and is largely a result of just this incredulousness that people would have had you know what are they talking about the sun moves from you know east to west it doesn't stay up in the north what were they talking about were they idiots but they do provide us and i'm speaking of these people they do provide us with the underlying authority to claim rulership so we've got to adapt it we we can't kick mythology down the road it certainly can't be uh, seen to uh, relate to anything in the real world. 
So they've developed a lot of superstitious beliefs and actions and behaviors by taking this on and taking this rule, this authority, without actually yeah. having the knowledge of, of why it, it occurred. Yeah, it's a, it's a disconnect. All right, it's a it's a disconnect, and 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 to be you know, in, I'm not in their defense or anything like that, but you can understand it's a completely logical disconnect. You read something about a sun sitting up in the north, you step outside and you see the sun going from east to west. It makes no sense, but you know that what you're reading is the source of authority that you can claim if you if you have desire to rule. So you develop, you start creating means by which you can not rationalize you go the opposite way you you create create the irrational to explain why these mythologies have have an authority that's intrinsic to them but you know again going back to the advent of the golden age what we have to remember is that what i've described that let there be light moment is also the moment where human beings begin to do something they have never been able to do before, and that is measure time. All right? So we have a scenario where the planet Saturn has fled, it's lost its plasmosphere, suddenly stars can be seen, a particularly bright star can be seen in the east and uh, so on, and it seems to sort of travel what is, becomes known as the east, and it travels across the sky and disappears in the west, and so it's, it's bigger than the rest of these uh, uh, stars. And you have another phenomenon. The planet Saturn itself has discharged material that has now formed rings around its outside. As a result of this, the light from the large star that can be seen now coming out from the uh, east is casting a shadow across these rings that are now, you know, the, the defining characteristic of the planet Saturn today is its rings. And you can see that effect even with the sun as it is today. Part of the shadow, part of the rings go into shadow. But the effect is, from Earth's perspective, that as you rotate on the Earth, that horseshoe-shaped ring that the shadow causes rotates around your, your old sun. This is what we call the planet, planet Saturn. And that in yes. itself becomes a mechanism for being able to tell time. And this, this is revolutionary. This is, humans have never had this ability. And of course, this ability is what I say results in the development of weights and measures, which ultimately moves into the rule of law that define the golden age. And it just happens to coincide at a time when with Saturn flaring and still in the north, the encroaching sun coming, you get the best of both worlds. You get the seasonless uh, environment of the of the purple dawn, but you also yes. get this uh, ability to tell time. You, your harvests are never a problem. You, you have this wonderful existence where work is not required. And you know what? When you're in a situation like that, people can get down to studying their environment. They can become interested and not have to worry about the daily grind of what we call making a buck today. All right? They can just get on with it. There's this there's this desire to explore this new world. I mean, you think about the effect. Your world has changed. Light bathes it. Uh, you can see things differently. And, and people begin an age of exploration that is governed by the greatest form of exploration, which is exploring weights and measures as a means of, of the rule of law and how they interact with other people. Wow, that's just... Yeah. <laughs> That's fascinating. Fascinating. 